ready? Okay. Just don't screw this up. Hey folks, my name is Nick Hawks, and I'll be talking to you guys about what's up on the board here, tracking pilots with helium. This is not helium the gas, this is helium the network. I'll start with how I found this thing, which was about this time last year, a little bit before it. There was a paraglider, who probably a lot of you guys know, who's lost over the skies of Nevada, Kiwi. And the call went out to the paragliding community to see if we could find him. When he was lost, at the time he was carrying what we consider was the gold standard of tracking, which is a Garmin InReach Mini, or any kind of uh, GPS Garmin device. And he had his backup as a cell phone. Um, if you don't know the end of the story, it did not end super well. It didn't end well at all. Uh, it took us a long time to find him, just under four weeks, I believe. And there was uh, hundreds of people joined into that effort. And he was dead when he hit the ground. So a pretty tragic story. I flew up there to be a very small part of that search effort, along with David Hunt, who is one of the hat winners. Uh, David's a, a pilot, paraglider pilot in fixed wing out of San Diego. And he called me up and said, hey, do you want to go help search for this guy? So I said, yeah. We went up there and uh, bumped around the skies of Nevada for a couple days looking for him. We didn't find him. Um, and I learned a couple things. Number one is that flying as a passenger in a small plane in the summer in Nevada low to the ground is my least favorite form of aviation. <laughs> And then number two, that what we had that was going on right then for tracking was not going to be good enough for me if I ever wanted to do any kind of, excuse my language, badass XE, which I may not ever do. But if I did, just the GPS alone wasn't going to be good enough. I wanted to find something else. So I went looking. Uh, when I came back to San Diego, got on the, the Googs just like everyone else and started looking around for what is there beyond GPS that might help you be found if you're way out back of beyond, not right down the street, um, not even in the park next door, but way out back beyond where there's no cell coverage and for whatever reason your GPS isn't working. Uh, a buddy of mine, Zach Armstrong, found this technology called LoRa, L-O-R-A for long range. It's a, a radio protocol that allows you to send really small packets of data, 10 digit grids, really long distances. Um, those distances are, while it's a wireless technology, they're way, far, uh, way further than Wi-Fi. So we're talking, I'll tell you a little bit about it later, but at least 30 miles. So this seemed like it was a cool thing, this LoRa thing. I looked around further for applications for tracking and for being found, and found a, a paraglider out in the Bay Area had actually developed this thing, uh, a whole project called Meshtastic. And Meshtastic was a way that you could buy a little, basically a tiny little computer with a little radio on it that used LoRa, and you could set up a traveling mesh network. Ah, with all your buddies, can you hear me now? There we go. Yeah, so you could set up this, uh, this mesh network with all your buddies while you're flying, and you could talk to each other over this mesh network. You could um, send out GPS coordinates inside that mesh network. But the downside of it was that unless you were an engineer who totally knew what they were doing and were really comfortable with soldering, it was really difficult to use. I'm not an engineer. I've become comfortable with soldering, but I wasn't at the time. And despite kind of rallying a couple of the local San Diego geek pilots, we couldn't get the thing to work for us reliably in a sense that you could put it in your backpack, forget about it, and actually use it. So Meshtastic for me was out. That led me to keep on searching um, what, was out, what else was out there with this LoRa thing, and that's when I found Helium. Helium is a network built on incentivizing, and this will freak you out, so I'll save it for the end, the incentivization part, but incentivizing people to deploy or to put up radio stations that can listen for sensor data. Now, what I as a paraglider, and I think all of us as paragliders, hang, hang gliders, free flight people, are most interested in are the tracking applications. But Helium was built for IoT, or the Internet of Things. So it can handle any kind of data you push up into it. So temperature, humidity, whether a car has passed by, whether a person has passed by, the weight of a scale, any number of things for tonight. And for kind of this set of presentations, we're going to focus on the tracking aspects of it. So this company, Helium, developed this way to make it really easy to put up these radio stations that could listen for data. And one of those pieces of data would come from a tracking device. The tracking devices are pretty small. And I've got one in my pocket that is just a tracking device. Um, I can hand it around if you guys want. It's a tracking device so I can find it at the end of it, although you guys can see how big it is. If you want to see them in person, they'll be over on the table. Um, but this is what we kind of came up with as, as, the, uh, as the solution. Now, one of the things you might ask is if the gateway, or the, the helium hotspot, which is what this radio is called that's listening for this um, tracking device, only goes 30 miles, is there one near my house? Has someone already put one up? Lee, can you hit me the next slide? So this is a picture of where helium hotspots are around the world 
right about now. There's about 200,000 of them on the network. At this time last year, there's only about 7,000 of them. So the network itself has grown pretty radically. You can still see that parts of the American West aren't super well covered. So when this event came along, I said, I want to try using the Helium network to track paragliders in a remote area. I'm going to build my own set of Helium hotspots that are fully off-grid. So they use solar panel and a uh, cell, cell phone backhaul. Thank you, Lee. And that's what they look like. So this is a Helium hotspot up on the Cove launch. Uh, it's a tiny little, cell, um, tiny little uh, cell modem and a solar panel. That thing can last pretty much throughout the winter as long as we don't get too much snow for it. It was actually built for San Diego, but I figured a week up here wouldn't do it any harm. Each Helium hotspot is named randomly a different name. They're all kind of funny. This one is called Fierce Honey Badger. Um, it, I didn't, well, I did choose that one. You're not supposed to be able to, but that's kind of how that works. So what that thing is doing and what it has been doing since Sunday when Stacy and I drove to both Cove and Monroe Peak and put these things up is tracking paragliders. So I got a couple different companies, including Lone Star Tracking. Ryan in the cowboy hat back there is, is uh, driven up from Texas to provide a bunch of trackers for us to test out for this, no pun intended, pilot project um, <laughs> to track you guys as, as you guys go around the sky. So the range on these things, I said earlier, was 30 miles. I gave these to uh, Revis and Trevor and Brian and, and I think seven other pilots on Sunday. Next slide, Lee. And um, you can see the furthest they were tracked away was 82 miles. So if you're a radio geek, you'll look at this, you'll see some stuff that is kind of radio geekery, DBM and RSSI and SNR. You don't really have to pay attention to that. Just look at the distance column on the far right. Um, and also look at the hotspots column on the far left. So you can see Fierce Honey Badger, which is the hotspot you just saw that's up on the Cove launch, is providing coverage. But there are also a couple other hotspots that are really far away, both far north and far south of the Severe Valley, that are also providing coverage up to, you can see that middle um, row on the right is 82 miles away. Sorry, we just found this. Oh, great. Looks like I won a wallet. If you, uh, if you want a wallet, come up to me and find it later. Um, so what we saw was that one surprising thing for me is that these trackers that are really small can track us, paragliders, as long as they have a clear line of sight from 82 miles away. That's pretty exciting for a couple reasons. Um, number one, you say like a GPS can track you anywhere on the planet. We'll go into the gruesome details of why you should wear these on opposite sides of your body later. But one of the cool things with these is those hot spots like the one that you saw up on the mountain that I showed can be mobile. So we can put one of those in a helicopter or a plane, fly around, and it's got, it would be a stretch to say it has an 80-mile bubble around it, but it certainly has a 30-mile bubble it can track around it. So we can fly that thing, run grids on whatever search area we need to run. We don't have to set up a hot spot on a mountain and ideally find a lost paraglider or hang glider a lot faster than we otherwise could. Next slide. This is the track of those guys that set the 180K triangle on Sunday. I'm not totally sure about that distance, but this is what it looks like after the fact. So put these things in your backpack, um, go flying, come back at the end of the day and see what you did. They push out a KML file, not an IGC, KML. So you can transfer that over to IGC if you're doing the comp stuff, um, and that is really important to you. It's not important to most of us. It's not super important to me. But that's what it looks like at the end of the day when you're looking at what you did. And you can see where they were driving a little bit. You see the straight lines. You see sometimes it doesn't pick it up right away. But this was tracking, I think, every 30 seconds. And um, next slide, Bugs. This is my wife over here. I call her Bugs, but her name is Lee. Please don't call her Bugs. Um, this is what it looks like when you're actually seeing them in action. So I just took a quick screenshot. You can see that these three that were labeled were, were booking along. This was uh, down south. I think these guys had launched from Junction that day. Um, and you can see the dude in the back is probably on bar. <laughs> okay, next one. We're closing on the end of it. Uh, bear with me. Okay, so what we've been doing this week is this pilot program. I wanted to see if this thing would work. And that if it did, I could show it and share it with you guys so that you could go home and if you wanted to, you could get these trackers for your own club. You could set up these hotspots at your own club so you can track your own pilots. And then if you wanted to, you can set up off-grid hotspots just like um, I've done. So you can pick these up and drop them off at the Canyon View LZ at the LZ in the morning. You can also just find me anytime during the week and I'll probably have one or two on me that I can trade out with you or I can take your old one. So I wanna make this as easy as possible for you guys to put these in your backpack, try it out. Check it out at the end of the day. If you carry one of these, I'll send you uh, more or less a private link that shows you what you did that day, what you and the other uh, pilots who are flying them did that day. 
Um, okay, the next thing, if you're gonna put these up at your club, and I think, I think you should, is you put that hotspot placement up at a high elevation and you're putting it up at a high elevation in order, in order to give it a clear line of sight. These devices operate as if they had binoculars and they can see as far as the binos can see anything else out there. So if you get them up super high, you get them up at 11,000 feet on top or 11,222 feet on top of uh, Monroe Peak, they can go pretty far. Um, if you've got them down in the valley where they're six feet high, there's just gonna be a lot harder for them to see anything. Luckily as paragliders, we spend most of our time up high so it's easier to be seen but ideally we want clear line of sight. Um, the second part is tracker placement. So usually the tracker when I fly with it is the last thing I put in my harness pack. And that's because I carry all my other stuff on the front where I can see it. So in reach mini and XC tracer and my little fly sky high phone, I'm putting it on my back in part to keep it high. It doesn't really make a huge difference because I'm already pretty high, but also in part in case I auger in and hit the ground super hard that and the GPS can't get through the foot and a half of human water that my body represents, that at least I've got a tracker on my back that can be seen from the sky, right? These aren't the things we want to think about, but that's how the, that's how the ball bounces sometimes. So keep it on the opposite side of your body as your regular GPS. Um, the last, or not the last part, the second to last part, the penultimate part is the battery life on these things. So battery life on these guys, if you set the tracking to fire at a one hour interval is, uh, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong here, is three years. So buy the thing, put three AAA, three AA batteries in it, and then set a calendar reminder to change your batteries in 2023. If you want to set it for 30 seconds, it'll last for a couple months. If you want to set it for five, five seconds, it'll last a week or two. That's about right. It depends, of course, on how much you're moving. As soon as you put them down within whatever the time interval is, they'll go to sleep. So if you bring it home, put your pack down in the garage, the thing goes to sleep, wakes up every hour and says, hey, here I am, and then goes back to sleep. As soon as it starts moving again, it starts tracking again. Um, if you end up getting this service, which I don't profit at all from this, I don't, I don't give a shit if you get it or not, I, I think you should, but I don't make any money off of it. Um, if you end up getting it, you can put, I believe, a geofence around your house so that nobody knows when you're home or you're not home, but when you're out flying, you can share this link with other people and they can see where you are. The very last piece is the part that I told you is probably gonna freak you out. And this is the part where this Helium network was built on a blockchain. That blockchain, which you may have heard when you heard about Bitcoin, that blockchain rewards you for putting up a gateway or for that, putting up that Helium hotspot with a cryptocurrency called HNT. I'll finish up by saying this is now my living. I do technology consulting about Helium and helping people put this in. If there is any paragliding club in the world who wants an hour of the consulting time, which is usually 500 bucks, I will donate that, donate that to you for free. Um, it's super important to me that any paraglider who wants to use this is able to, and there's no restriction on like, oh man, I don't know if the club can afford it. So just come to me, find me, tell me you're a paraglider, you're doing this for your club, I will walk you through how to do the best possible job, not only on the tracking, and, um, tracking side, but also on the earning side. So that should wrap it up. I'm gonna do a longer presentation on Helium and on going into some of the mining stuff and also some of the kind of tweaky stuff of off-grid placements um, tomorrow at 2 p.m. So that'll be an hour instead of whatever this was, 15 minutes. If you guys have any questions right now that are kind of burning on the top of your head, I'd love to answer them. You can raise your hand, yeah, shoot. Why do you think helium is better than GPS? Ah, it's a good question. Why is helium better than GPS? They're actually using the same thing. So that tracker is listening for signals from the satellites that are firing out the GPS um, signal. So it's, it's pulling in a GPS signal. The reason that Helium and really LoRaWAN, the underlying radio protocol, is not better, it's just an alternate, is that instead of firing a radio signal back up to the satellite, which takes a ton of energy and is on basically a different system, it's shooting it off through this LoRaWAN protocol, which is much lower energy. And so where your GPS, you have to recharge, I recharge mine every time I come back in. Um, so I'm thinking they last 24, maybe 48 hours. These have a much longer battery life. So the same location piece, just as accurate, longer battery life, and just an alternate piece. Um, that you can use. Cool. Uh, in the back. How much does it cost for one of those gateways, like the, like the off-grid one that you put up on the boat? Sure. The gateways, the, the um, equipment price is right around a thousand bucks if you build it yourself. You could probably spend a little more if you want it right now for, for the reasons that um, I went through before where Helium is making so much money. They're a little bit more expensive on eBay if you want them right away. If you don't mind waiting 20 weeks or so, it's going to be a, a little bit less. So let's say between 1000 and 2000 bucks, depending on how fast you want it all done. Do you pair it up with the radio stations, weather stations? 
Uh, you can. So that's one of the cool things about Helium is you can set up the gateway, and then the gateway can process any other signals, or any other data that you want to send through it. So if you want to send a weather station, weather station data through that, that weather station can operate on the LoRa network, which is what Helium uses. If you, let's say we leave these two hotspots up here that are up here right now, you could go up and down the Severe Valley and tell every farmer, hey, if you want to put data um, creating sensors in the ground and measure soil moisture, soil temperature, insulation, the amount of sun hitting the ground, leaf moisture, like any of those things, all of that will process through the hotspot you'll put up. You'll get paid a, a tiny little amount. It's pretty cheap for the farmer to do that. So you're actually enabling this valley or this area or whatever area is covered by the coverage of that hotspot to enter into this IoT world. It's a little bit more complicated and a, a bigger subject, but hopefully that answered the question. Say it again. Ah, trees. Yeah, so LoRa, just like um, almost every radio signal, it, it's, uh, attenuates or it's dampened by going through trees or other stuff. So if you're stuck in the trees, it doesn't seem to be a big problem. If you're in the bottom of a giant ravine with tons of trees and bushes over you, it'll probably be the same kind of thing as, as any other general radio signal. Um, but because we can get these gateways mobile and put them on a helicopter, um, it's a lot easier to, to kind of make that connection. We're not relying just on like a 30 foot, or sorry, a, a 30 mile away kind of thing. Does that answer the question? Sort of, yeah. It's, it's not a perfect technology, it's just pretty good. Ken. Ah, closer, thank you. I can hear myself so well up here. David. What's the tracker cost? Um, you'll have to double check with Ryan on that. I would say you can pencil in depending on how many you're gonna buy. I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but say between 60 and 100 bucks for the tracker, and then, I don't know, five to 10 bucks a month for the, the tracking, and I'm betting, I don't wanna put words in his mouth again, you can probably get volume discounts if you're doing a bunch of them. Don't shake your head too much at me, right? <laughs> cool. Anything else? Uh, shoot. Yeah, so what are these, uh, what's the reality of getting a tracker in a helicopter in different regions of the country for a recovery? Um, you can, it's, it's basically, let's see, I, I think I've got a gateway here that is, it's not an outdoor gateway, it's in this box. Oh, what was the question? What's, what's the um, potential or possibility of getting, a, getting one of these gateways in a helicopter? So, give me a second here. This is an indoor gateway. You can take this in a helicopter. You can hook this up. I think you can put a, a SIM card in this and hook this up to one of those like Goal Zero Yeti small battery devices and run this in. So as long as a helicopter will allow you to bring that on or will allow you to connect this thing to power, as you're flying around, you can just have this thing in it and it provides that coverage. So what I'm curious, Nick, is let's say my club puts one of these gateways up, but we have an incident where pilots down and we need a search and rescue, but there's nothing currently on the ground Sure. Um, to be honest, I haven't thought that totally through. I would just have an extra one. If I, if I went into this in a club, and especially if the club's in a remote area, right? In San Diego, it's not such a big deal. And in San Diego, we have incredible helium hotspot coverage anyway. But if you're out here in, in Utah, from what I've seen driving up here from San Diego, there's a lot of country to cover, is that you might just have an extra one of these laying around that just sits at someone's house. And if there's a search and rescue effort, you know that that's where you go. You grab it. You grab the battery pack for it and roll out. That'd be what I'd think of off the top of my head. Yep. A lot of this stuff is still really new, guys. Um, this whole thing just really kicked off about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, and so people are still discovering this. This is actually um, one of the cool things that Stacy was psyched on, is this is the first time that paragliders have ever been tracked with LoRa or Helium that I know about in, in this um, sense. And it's also one of the first real-world use cases that Helium has that is a person, which is their whole thing. They call themselves the People's Network, which is a person, which is me, putting a couple gateways out there, not having to be a big telecommunications company, a big telco, and able to provide coverage for hundreds of paragliders. So I've got a box full of these trackers in my truck that I'm gonna try and put together tonight so we can track a bunch of you guys tomorrow. But this is, it enables us to not have to worry about like asking someone permission to put up a gateway. We can just put one up, obviously on land that you own, um, and, and use this thing, use this new technology. Okay, I think that's, Wait, go ahead Mark, last one. Uh, would this have helped Kiwi? With this about Kiwi, man, that's a, that's a hard thing. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what configuration he ended up in. Um, I'd like to think it would have, but man, that's a, a hell of a thing to say that he should have done this. So I'll tell you this, is that I fly with one all the time. It's just one more chance to be found is the way I think of it. It's not perfect. It's, not a, it's certainly not a replacement for your in-reach mini. Um, it's just that one extra chance that for a cost that I think is pretty reasonable for, at least for me, uh, to be found if I ever go missing. 
All right, thank you guys, appreciate it. Oh, there's a lost wallet here. Hang on, let me read this guy's or girl's name. Jeez, Colorado, what do you guys use, like four-point font? Ben Parker. Is there a Ben Parker in the house? He left, I'll find him. I'll track him down. Give a big round of applause to Nick Lane.